Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the, seventh, the Sabbath School lessons that prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the first three months of 2015. In fact, this lesson is for January 24 of 2015. It's lesson number four in that series ent entitled Divine Wisdom. Divine Wisdom? What's divine wisdom? Is that different than human wisdom? And how are they related? Well, we'll have a look at that today. I hope you have your Bible handy because we will be looking at a number of passages. Before we start, though, we'd like to ask God to guide us in our study together. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we recognize your presence among us, may your Holy Spirit guide us in our thinking and help us to understand this very important topic about the divine wisdom that's referred to even in the New Testament in several places. We're not quite sure exactly how this chapter was written or exactly how it was put together by Solomon, whether he borrowed ideas from others before he did, we don't know. But there are some very clear messages for us and probably it's likely that this passage was inspired directly by you to Solomon. Help us now to gather the information that best serves our needs today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this lesson, we're going to discuss a new kind of wisdom, I would like to suggest. And I think this wisdom is particularly exciting. It seems to be consistent with truth and even a personification of truth. The idea that truth could be absolute is not widely accepted in contemporary thinking. Many people in our day believe that truth is relative, culturally determined and dependent upon one's background. What do you think? Is truth absolute or is it relative? Anybody have any strong opinions? I think it should be absolute. And that's part of the world's, big part of the world's problems because mm -hmm. it gets twisted so much, constantly. Mm -hmm. do, do you know any absolute truth? <laughs> yeah. I, I believe it exists, but how do you, do you really, are you really conceiving it correctly? God is love. God never changes. You know, that's what my grandmother said. I'd, I'd ask her what love is, and she would say, God is love. Mm -hmm. And... I'm looking for a definition of love. She says, God is love. That's so right. how well, let am me, I going to me, me, know yeah. by that definition how, what love is when they just say okay. it that way with those words? We, we, we start out talking about truth. Let, let's deal with we, truth before we go talking about love. Well, isn't that truth? Well, it's one aspect of truth, <laughs> yeah. I, I, what I say is that truth is the way things are the way things happen, the, the, the historically, and so forth. And I give an example of that, that um, m and many years ago now, what, maybe 20 years ago now, um, there was a trial here in the United States that just seemed to be, everybody's eyes were glued on this trial for months. And this was a, a trial of O.J., a famous football personality, and the question is whether or not he had murdered his wife and a friend of his wife. And my illustration of truth or not truth, that thing went back and forth and back and forth, and finally he was declared not guilty. Um, my explanation of real truth would be, in, in, if God had been conducting that trial, there wouldn't be all this back and forth and months of watching on television trying to figure out what's going to happen, what this jury is going to decide. God would have said, okay, everybody sit down, be comfortable, push the button, I will show you exactly what happened. Here's the 3D living color picture of exactly how it happened. It takes about 15 minutes to see the whole thing or maybe half an hour, I don't know, to see the whole thing. And at the end, God would say, does anybody have any questions? No. Why not? Because we have just seen the truth. If you know exactly what happened, that's the truth. Okay, you're, that's absolutely true if you assume that the videos are correct. Well, 
if you have questions about God's ability to reproduce the accident. Isn't that kind of the great controversy? Yes. Well, there you go. So where's the truth at? Where's your absolute truth at right now? Only with God. Only with God. Sure. Okay. And but not the, only does God have that 3D video, but he has the intentions, the thoughts of people, mm -hmm. the motives of people that he, of why they did things. Maybe they did, maybe some people do bad things for a good reason. Okay. Um, but what you just told me was a bunch of words. Is yeah, that is that the truth? That's a, an apparent. That's an attempt to communicate. <laughs> I know. See, I think that's what the problem with when you say absolute truth is that we're all communicating, and you know we're not hitting it right on yeah. all the time, and that's oh. that's the only point, you know, that somebody may have when he says, yeah. "Well, there's no absolute truth." I say. We may not see the absolute truth, but I believe that God is God and He's true, and He is the absolute truth. Okay, so now that leads, us, that leads us to our next question. How do we discover truth and wisdom? Does truth speak to us in some way, some special way? If so, how does that happen? Do we learn? I mean, you know, there are people, uh, we've all heard about them, who have like visions in the night that they should get up and take a baseball bat and, and, and beat their family to death. Mm. They do it. They claim that God told them to do that. Is that, is that the way truth is revealed? No. Or is truth revealed only through God's Word? How do we actually find out what's truth? The concept of truth starts in infancy, basically. If you haven't got parents with some kind of guidance to even set you on the right trail. It's, it's almost a lifetime thing. Mm -hmm. Continual. But don't you think truth comes from observation of you need enough time to, to observe enough mm -hmm. and to find consistencies and even though how long do you take to find enough consistency yeah. to say that I have the truth finally? It's almost like it's almost like a continual process that's yeah. happening forever. Well, one thing about truth, it can never be inconsistent with itself. It can never be inconsistent with itself. It might seem inconsistent, but when you know the whole story, in any given case, if you can know the whole story, it's not going to be inconsistent with itself. Look at these words from Proverbs 8, which is our main focus of our lesson. Well, it goes into Proverbs 9, but listen. Wisdom is calling out. Reason is making herself heard. So wisdom and reason are, are parallel here. On the hilltops near the road and at the crossroads she stands. At the entrance to the city beside the gates she calls. I appeal to all of you. I call to everyone on earth. Are you immature? Learn to be mature. Is wisdom offering that to us? Are you foolish? Learn to have sense. Listen to my excellent words. All I tell you is right. What I say is the truth. Lies are hateful to me. Everything I say is true. Nothing is false or misleading. To those with insight, it is all clear. To the well-informed, it is all plain. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Choose knowledge rather than the finest gold. I am wisdom. I am better than jewels. Nothing you want can compare with me. I am wisdom, and I have insight. I have knowledge and sound judgment. To honor the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil ways and false words. I make plans and carry them out. I have understanding, and I am strong. I help kings to govern and rulers to make good laws. Every ruler on earth governs with my help, officials and nobles alike. I love those who love me. Whoever loves, looks for me can find me. I have riches and honor to give, to give, prosperity and success. What you get from me is better than the finest gold, better than the purest silver. I walk the way of righteousness, I follow the paths of justice, giving wealth to those who love me, filling their houses with treasures. Is that your understanding of wisdom? Sounds like an analogy of God to me. Yeah. Well, it promises a great deal, doesn't it? 
His wisdom always well informed and plain to those who think clearly? In what sense is it more valuable than silver and gold? Do we, is every wise person hateful of evil? Wisdom hates pride, it says, arrogance, evil ways, and false words. Wisdom gives wealth to those who love it, filling their houses with treasures. So all the wise people are the ones who are very rich and the foolish people are the ones who are very poor? Depends what your treasure is. <laughs> Well, let me ask this question. What is the relationship between wisdom or truth, they seem to be related, and salvation? Is there a relationship? Well, isn't um, discipline, isn't a person who takes discipline, isn't that kind of wise? A person who learns from discipline, you're saying? Or, yeah. Well, will actually take it like from their father yeah. Or their mother. Yeah. And um, they learn from it. Okay. Well, Proverbs 8 is trying to tell us that wisdom, well, trying to suggest perhaps that wisdom is the personification of the Son of God. Now, let's, let's explore that possibility. Is Jesus crying out in every possible way to communicate with human beings? Yes. He is. Does he know that getting to know the truth about him is a matter of life and death? Yes, he knows that. In our days of mass communication through radio, television, social media, etc., why is it that so many people still live in ignorance, folly, and darkness? Look at Matthew 16, 26. Will people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. There's nothing they can give to regain their life. Familiar passage. They may be very wealthy, but there's nothing they can give in exchange for their life. Well, look at the rest of Proverbs 8, starting with verse 22. The Lord created, now this might more be a little more obvious that this is talking about the Son of God. The Lord created me, first of all, the first of his works long ago. I was made in the very beginning, at the first before the world began. Now we're going to have to be careful about this being made or created. We'll talk about that in a moment. I was born before the oceans, where, when there were no springs of water. I was born before the mountains, before the hills were set in place, before God made the earth and its fields, or even the first handful of soil. I was there when he set the sky in place, when he stretched the horizon across the ocean, when he placed the clouds in the sky, when he opened the springs of the ocean and ordered the waters of the sea to rise no further than he said. I was there when he laid the earth's foundations. I was beside him like an architect. I was his daily source of joy, always happy in his presence, happy with the world and pleased with the human race. So what does that tell us about wisdom? Been around for quite a while, right? Um, it seems like there are quite a few similarities between what we just read in Proverbs 8 and Genesis 1 and 2. Right? Where God is creating everything and he tells, you know, he creates the sky, he creates the water, he creates the light, he creates everything. That verse 22 of the Lord, is that Yahweh? Sounds like it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you use the Genesis 1 and 2 as a parallel. Yeah. It's in capital letters in my version, which translates as Yahweh. Yahweh, yeah. Therefore, if wisdom is a fundamental part of the universe and necessary for existence, shouldn't we do our best to learn as much as possible about it? Does wisdom mean to do what is right because it is right? That's what it seems to be saying. Yeah, seems to suggest that. And how would we learn to do what's right because it is right? No, it's right. <laughs> well, we, and we need a certain amount of experience, probably, don't we? Yeah. 
in, in philosophers and social psychologists talk about levels of maturity. And those levels of maturity start from the people who just do what they're told because they're afraid, or they either think they're going to get rewarded for doing it, or they're afraid they will get punished if they don't do it. Then there's a level what's called the ordinary level, sort of, I'm not going into the te technical names, where people tend to do what's right because everybody else around them is doing that. So their, their main force is peer pressure. But then there's a certain group of people who get mature enough, so they say, you know, there's a certain thing that's the right thing to do here. And I'm going to do what's right even if nobody else is doing what's right. And those people are the people who act out of principle. Would that be a description of people who are really wise? Mature. <laughs> Mature, yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes it's easy to understand that by looking at the opposite. What would be the opposite? People doing things because I say so. Only because they're afraid of being punished or they're hoping for some reward. They don't think for themselves, they just do what they're told to do. Yeah, but don't you think that reward is imposed? Yeah. Because when you go against the truth, the truth will come back to you and mm -hmm. punish you also. So one is kind of done arbitrarily, and the other one is done because that's the way things are, are around us. Romans 8 here suggests that wisdom was present before this world was created. Who, who was there before this world was created? Jesus. Well, let's mention several things. Do we know several? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Father, yeah, Son, and Holy angels. Spirit, and angels, and presumably beings from other worlds were already there. Nobody from this world was there, obviously. Uh, so is that, are we getting more and more hints that this is wisdom in this context is a code word for Jesus Christ? Well, in the beginning there was the word. Mm -hmm. So is the word wisdom? In Roman, I'm sorry, in Proverbs 8 it says, I am wisdom. Does that remind you of anything? I am. I am. Yahweh. Mm -hmm. The word which means I am. Yeah. I am. So how are we supposed to get wisdom? Especially this kind of wisdom. Do we, do we study hard and get it out of books? Do we learn it from experience? We learn by looking at God. So you're saying it's the only way we can get real wisdom is through revelation. Not the book of revelation, but through God's revelation, right? We can perhaps get a little bit from wise people around us who mm -hmm. have experience too, but ultimately it comes from God. Mm -hmm. Okay, John 1, 9. Look at that for a second. And I read it from my Good News Bible. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. And who is that? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Um, symbolically understood, the light could be parallel to wisdom, couldn't it? Because it illuminates what we are looking at and it helps us to understand things. Well, it's a fairly well-known fact that in Genesis 1, following each day of creation, God saw that it was good, right? I have a neat little thing on my computer program here that you might want to look at. You, well, here I pushed it too hard. Hold on. If I just put my cursor over the comma here, if I'm lucky. Oh, it's not working for me right now. I can get all these verses to show up at the same, there we are, all of them. It was, God was pleased with what he saw, God was pleased with what he saw, God was pleased with what he saw, and so forth. But then in verse 31, after creating man, what did he say? It's very it was good. very good. Not just it was good, it was very good. The word good here implies a relationship and the idea of enjoyment. Was God happy on that first Sabbath? 
God paused to enjoy his creation in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Does that teach us anything about how the Sabbath is to be experienced? Yeah. Are we supposed to enjoy the Sabbath? Absolutely. I think so. Absolutely. It's not supposed to be a burden. It's not supposed to be a pain, some kids would say. Look at Proverbs 8, 30 and 31. I was beside him like an architect, talking about the Creator now. I was his daily source of joy, always happy in his presence, happy with the world and pleased with the human race. We read in, in, in Genesis 1 that at the very end he said when man was created it was very good, right? Now it says whoever this is talking about was also pleased with the human race, right? Is that another reason to suggest that we're talking about Jesus Christ? Now, when he said it was very good, are you sure it was because of man? Or was it because of the whole work? Well, he said earlier, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, and then it was very good. But if it was the whole work, why, why, why wouldn't he say it's very good all along? Because when you get done with all the parts that are very good, or that are good, you get done with the whole thing, and it's very good. Well, and if you, but if you're putting man in charge of everything, then he should be the crowning act of creation. Okay, if you want to interpret it that way, I guess. Yeah. Well, what about us? If we work hard during the week and we're doing a constructive job of some kind, a, a worthwhile job, but we're, which we're comfortable doing, we like what we do, at the end of the week, shouldn't we be able to look back and say, I'm happy about what I do. I'm, I'm glad what I, because of what I accomplished this week. We should be satisfied with our work, right? What if the whole point is that when you do some work, you, after you're done, you, you stand back and you find out whether it's good or not? I mean, good as in it's a blessing to others. It's a blessing to the whole universe. It's a, you know, it, it all works out good mm -hmm. type of thing. And maybe that's what he was doing when, when he was creating, creating everything. Whereas before, it was just a dark earth with no yeah. light, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, his work is making it better. Do we know, in the case of the original creation week here, do we know that Jesus Christ was present there? Well, he wasn't exactly named that then. Well, he, he was, he was the, he was the creator. How do you know that? First Corinthians. Well, let's let me pick out a few spots. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn Son, and uh, I meant to meant to go back and talk about being born back there in Proverbs 8. Being born means not being born, as in person being born here, but that, the way that expression is constructed in Hebrew it means to be someone taking on a new role. And we, we need to talk about what that new role was. But look at here now at Colossians 1.15. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn Son, superior to all created things. For through Him, God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. God created the whole universe through Him and for Him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Another place that, that's very familiar, John 1, verse 1, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning the Word was with God. Through him God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. Is that pretty explicit? I mean, there are other passages, but those two, I think, should be pretty clear. We know that man has shrunk a lot since creation, deteriorated since leaving the Garden of Eden. Aren't you encouraged to know that the one who created us in the beginning has the creative power to restore us to the Eden-like condition at the second coming? Would, you, would we like to find out that Adam is more than twice as tall as 
we are living now and it would be like that forever or would you rather have us grow up to be more like our first father and mother, I should add. Wouldn't that, create, wouldn't that take creative power? To be that big, you'd have to have a lot better joints and bones and everything else than we have. Well, it says the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations, but it, yep. it brings up a topic I never really thought of. If Christ maintained humanity, is he, is he regained height that he never had? He must either have or White will. seems to suggest that, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She talks about Adam as being slightly lower than the Son of Man. Okay. Slightly shorter. Well, look at Matthew 6, 33. Instead of being concerned above everything else with the kingdom of... Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what He requires of you, and He will provide you with all these other things. What's supposed to be first on our priority list? First, to be the kingdom of God. Yeah. The kingdom of God. Say that all the time. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? Well, and let, let me take the other side of the coin. Look around at the Christians that you know. How many of them live lives as if seeking the kingdom of God is the first thing, first priority in their lives? How would you know that? I'm asking you. Do you see any evidence of that? Well, do you be. see do you see people flocking into the church because people are out there telling the truth about Jesus? No. We're not doing enough of it, are we? So is that is that the problem? Maybe we don't have the message yet. Well what I what I know is this. I, I you know, I, I all I can go on is, is what is scripture tells us when Jesus died there were 11 disciples left mm -hmm. a little while later in the upper room there was 120 people a little while after that there were thousands and those few people starting out with those 11 within their lifetimes and their lifetimes were cut short by martyrdom almost every one of them within that short period of time within about 30 years even their enemies said, these people have turned the world upside down. So, what about us? Are we turning the world upside down? Not yet. Not yet. It, it, that was, the Spirit did come down to them for them to do that. And it, why did, don't we have clear evidence that he wants to do that again? But he hasn't. I'm asking. I know he wants to do it, but he hasn't. And why he hasn't, I'm not so sure about yet. I think. But can you really say he hasn't? Now, we, we commented on this a couple of Sabbaths ago, and we are covering the world with what we believe right now. And there are parts of the world where we don't get. And something's getting to them because they go in there finally in certain places in this. Sabbath keepers and churches. Mm -hmm. So something's happening somewhere. Yeah. We're probably too preoccupied to be that far along. We should be yeah. much better. Well, here's a comment from Ellen White. The sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 1 and 2. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, and that word only begotten means what? The only one of a certain kind. Unique. Unique. Son of God. Was one with the new, eternal Father, one in nature and character and purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. And who was it that got in trouble because he wanted to join that group? Lucifer. Lucifer. And the Son of God declares concerning himself, quote, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, I was and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. And guess what they're quoting? 
Proverbs 8, 22 to 30. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets. Well, if wisdom is to be associated with creation, what does that imply about those who believe in evolution? Yeah, found wanting. <laughs> Scientists believe that by studying astronomy and biology and by using particle accelerators to tear out apart atoms, they can discover what we, where we came from. I can tell you, I just heard on, the, on one television program, a news item this morning, someone announced that they believed that all the water on this earth came from, um, came from basically comets that had water in them that crashed on this earth sometime in the past. Can you imagine how, much, how many comets it would take to produce all the water on this earth? And, and, I mean, that doesn't solve the problem. Where did the water come from? Yeah. All those comments come from. Have you heard the latest, what the Pope said about uh, science? I was surprised. Mm. But he came out saying, you know, everything is not, you know, dusted the Lord. Science has its merit and this and that. Mm. And it was surprising to hear, you know. Mm. But a lot of people appreciate that he said that. Part, you know. Yeah. Well, by contrast, the Bible says that we can only learn about our origins through the revealed will of God. How many important things can you think of that we would not know anything about if it were not for God's revealed will in Scripture? Would we know anything about why Jesus had to die? Would we know anything about the second coming? Would we know anything about creation? If God was really happy and really enjoyed that Sabbath at the end of the creation week, does that tell us anything about how we should observe the Sabbath? I'm not trying to be difficult here. I'm just raising some <laughs> questions. <laughs> but uh, I was, it prompted me to think right now, the revealed will, I don't disagree, but does, do you roll that over into what we've seen in our lifetime? Atomic power? electricity and all those variations and tied into it? Yeah. Would have to be, wouldn't it? Well, Seventh-day Adventists have come to believe that Christ has always been the mediator between the infinite God and his creatures. He walked among angels as an angel. What was his name? Michael the Archangel. He walked on this earth as a human being, among humans as Jesus. What does this tell us about his mediatorial role? How did Jesus relate to Adam and Eve before the fall? Was he truly Emmanuel, that is, God with us? I would think he was really Emmanuel back in the garden, right? Do you think that the Godhead, the three members of the Godhead, and everybody else for that matter who joined them, the angels, had a wonderful time on that first Sabbath? The Hebrew in Proverbs 8 implies a vibrant, even playful joy and fellowship among the members of the Godhead at creation. Does your picture of God allow for that? Why does some religion want to kill the joy out of the God thing? Yeah. <laughs> joy is sinful. I get it. Well... We've looked at John 1, 1 to 3. In the New Testament, Christ is referred to as the Word. What is the relationship between the Word and the divine wisdom in Proverbs 8? And when we call him the divine Word, what, what is implied by the divine Word? Well, words have meaning. Okay. So what, what, what meaning. do words do? Words communicate. They're, okay. they're symbols. Think about it. You get an idea in your brain. You transmit nerve pulses to your mouth, your tongue, your throat, and you produce vibrations in the air. Those vibrations travel through space, a certain distance, and they hit somebody else's eardrum. And those vibrations signal a certain combination of things in his brain, which is very complicated, and that person, with a little luck, gets an idea in his brain similar to what you started out with. 
if that, if that actually happens, and this idea is pretty close to what you had in mind, then communication has taken place. Okay? Encoding, decoding, and noise. And all that, exactly. So how does Jesus price fit with all that? That was what? How does Jesus become a word? We've just talked about how words work. How did Jesus, in what sense is Jesus a word? Well, we talk about him. So in a way, he's word there. Okay. But, and I, and I don't want, because we still have a lot of things to cover. Jesus has become, hopefully, the means by which God's ideas are communicated to his creatures, right? Isn't that what words do? Seems like it to me. Well, look at Proverbs 8, 12, 8 12 to 21, and 8, 32 to 36. And, and well, I, we'll take a moment to look at those. I am wisdom, and I have insight. We, we already read this. I have knowledge and sound, sound judgment. And then let's drop down to 32. Now, young people, listen to me. Do as I say, and you will be happy. Listen to what you are taught. Be wise. Do not neglect it. Those who listen to me will be happy. Those who stay at my door every day waiting for the entrance, waiting at the entrance to my home. Those who find me find life, and the Lord will be pleased with them. Those who do not find me hurt themselves. Anyone who hates me loves death. So, how, do, how, how does that fit with our picture of Christ being possibly the example of God's wisdom? I think it's, it's interesting to note that even non-believers in this world as we have it today would agree pretty much in the majority that he was the one man that had the widest influence on this world. Yeah. Even today they recognize it. Yeah. Well, if you compare, you'll discover that in both of the passages up above and passage down below in, in Romans 8, I'm sorry, in Proverbs 8, he is described as the giver of life and death. And two, he's, he's, re, he's spoken of as the source of legitimate government. Three, he's talked about as the one who is to be sought after, found, and called. Four, he's talked about as the one who loves and is to be loved. Um, and that's in different parts of Scripture. Five, he's the giver of wealth. Six, he's the source of divine revelation. And, I mean, those, just, those are just some examples in there. And we've already mentioned that in Proverbs uh, eight twelve. Let's just look at that for a moment again. I am wisdom, and we've talked about that being parallel to what? The word, the Hebrew meaning for the word Yahweh, Yahweh right? Yahweh, I am. I am. Yeah, it's grammatically parallel to that Hebrew name for Yahweh. Okay. So here we see an expression such as wisdom being referred to as if it were a defined, distinct personality or person. There's a technical term for that that probably doesn't matter too much, but I'll just mention it. It's called a hypostasis. It means when you, you use a, and we sometimes do this, we talk about a person as being all wise and all whatever, whatever, a whole bunch of things that we think really this person exemplifies all those things. That's a hypostasis. Not a hypothesis, but a no. hypostasis. Right. Well, look at Ellen White with her third, third grade education, right? This is what she says. Before Abraham was, I am. And where does that come from? John 8. John 8. Remember Jesus' discussion <coughs> with, the, with the Sanhedrin. Christ <coughs> is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. The message he gave to Moses to give to the children of Israel was, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. The prophet Micah writes of him, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. What do we mean when we say everlasting? From the beginnings. Been around for quite a while, right? Yeah. Through Solomon, Christ declared, 
And there's our passage from Romans 8. I keep saying what Romans, I'm sorry, Proverbs 8. And speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. Signs of the Times, August 29, 1900, paragraphs 13 to 15, and that's, of course, quoting Ellen White. Well, in those passages we looked at a moment ago, Proverbs 8, 32 to 36, wisdom takes on a very solemn but happy note. If we seek wisdom, we will find life and we will be happy. You think that's true? Not necessarily. Does, does, happy, does wisdom bring happiness? How, how would wisdom bring happiness? It keeps you... If we say in wisdom as Jesus... Well, he would be the ultimate example, okay. yes. Okay. Well, if, we say, if we're using Jesus, then it's obvious because once we know Jesus, we spend time with him, we get to become more and more like him, then we naturally, we change in a way that, you know, good things make us happy. Mm -hmm. so, so Jesus is good, so we're happy, so I get that. Okay. If you, if you know wisdom and you choose to do what is right, you never need to have any regrets, right? No. You don't have to try to make excuses. You don't have to try to ask for forgiveness. There's a lots of ways in which happiness can come if we're wise. Well, unless later on in life you found some better wisdom and then you kind of wish that you would have done it before. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I guess that's always a possibility. Well, the word blessed, used frequently in the New Testament, means happy. And look at Psalm 119, verses 1 and 2. Happy are those whose lives are faultless, who live according to the law of God. Happy are those who follow His commands, who obey Him with all their heart. Do you find that the most religious people are the most happy? Or do some religious people seem pretty... Uh, it should be, but it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't always work out that way. They don't look happy. Some of them, <laughs> yeah. they look up tight, angry, <laughs> angry man. Is, is that like long life? <laughs> yeah. It just seems long to them. <laughs> it's not really longer, it just seems longer? <laughs> yeah. Well, we need to recognize that these are not one-time events. You can't just all of a sudden have a flash of wisdom and, okay, that takes care of it for life. We're talking about a continuous effort here. Daily study of God's Word and looking unto Jesus is our assignment. Look at Luke 11, verse 28. But Jesus answered, Rather, how happy are those who hear the Word of God and obey it. Right? Well, the first phrase in Proverbs 8, verse 30, further describes wisdom as the architect or master craftsman. My Good News passage, translation says, I was beside him like an architect. What does an architect do? Designs. Design and Designs Design. Design. plan. You think Jesus had anything to do with designing the way this world was made? Somebody had to. Yeah. Did he have anything to do with making this world? Yes, we should yeah. say the yes also. Yeah. Is Proverbs 8 specifically being considered by New Te uh, New, Te New Te I'm sorry. Is Proverbs 8 specifically being considered by New Testament writers in places like John 1, 1 to 3, 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30? Let me just read a couple of these in, in light of what we read in John 8, I mean Proverbs 8. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 1, 24. But for those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Does that sound vaguely familiar? And if you drop down to verse 30, he chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. God has brought you into union with Christ and God has made Christ to be our 
wisdom. I think those people had Proverbs in mind when they wrote those words. Well, let me look at one more. Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, another famous passage talking about Christ's creative ability. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets, but in these last days, He's spoken to us through His Son. He is the one through whom God created the universe, the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with His powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for human sins, he sat down in heaven at the right-hand side of God, the supreme power. Isn't that pretty clear that Jesus was right there with the Father when during creation? How did he achieve forgiveness for the sinners? Well, I thought, I thought God was already... Forgiveness personified? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think I just think that means he he was like that. Well, look at Proverbs eight twenty two to twenty five. This could be misunderstood. The Lord created me first of all, the first of His works long ago. Does that mean that Christ was a creature instead of a creator? I was made in the very beginning, at the first, before the world began. I was born before the oceans, when there was no springs of water. I was born before the mountains, before the hills were set in place before God made the earth and his fields or even the first handful of soil. Does that mean Jesus was, was a creature? Well, isn't that... Does it, is it talking about Jesus? Or is it talking about wisdom? Well, we, we, we're talking here, we're suggesting here that it's talking about Jesus as symbolized by wisdom. Symbolized by wisdom, but it is talking about wisdom. Well, Don't you need... Before you start with any oceans or rivers or streams, you have to have the wisdom first to, to create them. Mm -hmm. and, don't, and don't you not see the wisdom until they're created? When they're created, well, then you see the wisdom. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you can say that wisdom was born right before it was created. Yeah. However, the Hebrew word gives us another suggestion. The Hebrew form, particular form used here in, in Proverbs 8 uh, refers to someone being installed or placed in a new role. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. Notice that Psalm 2 suggests that... Um, let me look at this again. Psalm 2 suggests that Christ would become the everlasting king of the universe after his incarnation. Let's just look at that. Why do the nations plan rebellion? Why do people make their useless plots, their kings revolt, their rulers plot to, together against the Lord and against the king he chose? Let us free ourselves from their rule, they say. Let us throw off their control. And then I'm going to drop down. I will announce, verse 7, says the king, what the Lord has declared. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask and I will give you, give you all the nations. The whole earth will be yours. You will break them with an iron rod. You will shatter them in pieces like a clay pot. So we take that to mean a, a story about Christ's incarnation. By contrast, at Proverbs 8 seems to point backwards to the time when before the creation of this world, right? Listen, wisdom is calling out. Reason is making herself heard on the hilltops, near the roadside, and across, and so forth. And we got down to verse, um, here, let's see. I was, verse 23, I was made in the very beginning, at the first, before the world began. That sounds like someone going way back to the beginning, right? Well, um, Surely it must have been Christ's role as a mediator or a friend to God's creatures that was his beginning role at the point of creation. And who does Christ mediate with? We've mentioned this already, but let's just nail that point down. The infinite to, to the creatures. Yeah, the, the creator to the creatures. Does that mean just the people on this earth? No. Who else is included? No. The entire universe, including the angels. That's why he's called Michael the archangel, the first of angels, right? 
Um, Ellen White speaks quite extensively about Michael the Archangel. Are there passages in the Old Testament that support this idea? Did Jesus ever appear as an angel or messenger of the Lord even here on this earth? Yes. Yeah, times. lots of times. We think about Joshua. Genesis 16, he appears to, and 22 and 24 and 48, he appears to, to Abraham multiple Abraham. times and he appears to Jacob. In Exodus, he appears to Moses. In Judges, he appears to uh, the judges, the, the family of Manoah and his, his wife and so forth. So, this clearly, he, he was a messenger. He's a, and the, the Greek word angel means messenger. He's trying to convey truth to mm -hmm. his creatures. Yeah. Well, a lot of people feel, well, we're so glad that Jesus is the one who represents the Godhead to us because you can't be too sure about the Father, right? How different would be things be if the Father had come down instead of the Son? Exactly the same. Right How do you know that? He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know what the Father is like? Look at Jesus. That's what Jesus said. Well, these words from Ellen White make that pretty clear. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling His glory and humbling Himself that humanity might look upon Him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of His own condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of His instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight and hearing and effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. But language seems to be so feeble. I refrain with John, uh, I refrain, and with John exclaim, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 1 John 3, 1. And that's found in that you may know him, page 38, paragraph 4, and some of you might be familiar with a book that's not very widely known, volume 21 of, of manuscript releases, page 393. Well, now we need to speak briefly in the few minutes we have left of the first few verses in Proverbs 9. Let's look at them. Wisdom has built her house and made seven pillars for it. She has had an animal killed for a feast, mixed spices in the wine, and laid the table. She has sent her servant women to call out from the highest place in the town. Come, ignorant people, and to the foolish, she says, Come, eat my, my food and drink, the wine that I have mixed. Leave the company of ignorant people and live. Follow the way of knowledge. If you correct conceited people, you will only be insulted. If you reprimand evil people, you only get hurt. Uh, never correct conceited people. They will hate you for it. But if you correct the wise, they will respect you. Anything you say to the wise will make them wiser. Whatever you tell the righteous will add to their knowledge. To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. Wisdom will add years to your life. You are the one who will profit if you have wisdom, and if you reject it, you are the one who will suffer. And then, stupidity is like a loud, ignorant, shameless woman. She sits at the door of her house, and what is she doing? On a seat in the highest part of the town, calls out to people passing by who are minding their own business. Come in, ignorant people. To the foolish, she says, stolen water is sweeter. Stolen bread tastes better. Her victims do not know that the people die who go to her house, that those who have already entered are now deep in the world of the dead. So we see two groups calling out. We see wisdom calling out, and we see stupidity calling out, right? What's the contrast? Well, Wisdom is, and I'm, this is in our handout, and again, I, you're welcome to get this if you would like. It's available online. Wisdom is efficient and is involved in creation. Seven verbs are used to describe her actions there in verses 1 through 3. The seven pillars she has hewn allure, allude to the seven days of creation. Folly, in contrast, sits and does nothing, just pretending to be someone when in fact she is simple and knows nothing. Two. Although wisdom and folly call the same audience, you can see everybody who's passing by are being called, verses 4 and verse 16, what they provide is essentially different. Wisdom invites her guests, guests to eat the bread and drink the, wine, the drink that she has prepared. Folly offers nothing to eat or drink. She simply boasts about stolen provisions. 
Three, wisdom calls us to forsake foolishness and therefore to live. Folly is more tolerant. She does not demand that we forsake anything, but the result is death. Those who follow wisdom will be advancing. They will go in the way of understanding. Those who follow, follow folly will be static and they will not know. Those is a part of our Bible study guide for Thursday of January 22. So if we look at the words, words in the middle, we've already looked at them in Proverbs 9, 7 and 9. Is it clear from these verses why the wise are wise and the wicked are foolish? What do the wise do? They learn from wisdom. What do the foolish do? They ignore it. Is it clear why, why, why the wise are wise and the wicked are foolish? The key to wisdom seems to be humility. Is that, is, is that why God exhorted us to become like little children? The most important characteristic of a child is ability to learn. His capacity to grow and learn. Biblical obedience means a humble willingness to listen. Let me repeat that. Biblical obedience means a humble willingness to learn. In actual fact, or to listen, in actual fact, um, modern, in modern terminology, obedience means you do it. In the biblical terminology, obedience means you want to do it. You may not be able always, but at least you want to do it. You're willing to listen and to learn. That's obedience in the biblical terms. Someday, we will be able to see the process by which God created our world. It's described as a panorama that the people are going to see at the end of this world's history. It will be a marvelous revelation. But for now, try to imagine what it might have been like. Do you think God was enjoying himself creating our world? The Hebrew word for rejoice in Proverbs 8, 30 and 31 can apply laughing, sport, even play. Does your picture of God allow for that? Yes. Do you think we'll have a marvelous time when we meet with God in the heavenly, in the new heaven, in the new earth? And what will we do? I'm sure he has so many wonderful things planned for our entertainment and for our instruction and for our wisdom. It will be marvelous, and we all need to be there. Our kind and Father, we thank you for the instruction we have here. Some of this is a little bit complicated in terms of the way it's spelled out, but we see shining through this wisdom and its role and before creation and at the end of this earth's history. May we be a part of it as our prayer in Jesus' name.